out, sort of distilling all this stuff you've been talking about and writing about for the past 11 years. Books called Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. So when in your work with entrepreneurs, business leaders, creative types, what have you found are the biggest roadblocks that you see over and over again that prevent people from taking an idea that they have from start to finish? I'm glad we're starting here, but I wanted to start actually by rolling it back a little bit because sure. you know I do teach a lot about productivity. And the first thing we think about with productivity, since the way that the conversation has gone, it's about doing more and getting more stuff done. But the reality is, Brett, I actually help my clients do like fewer things, but just the more important things. I, I think part of the frustration that so many of us have is that it seems like we're doing a lot, but when we look back over the month or the quarter or the year, it doesn't feel like we did the things that mattered most. And so a few things are more exasperating than knowing like, man, I've been out on the field. I've been like checking the list. I've been watching, you know, all the stuff's going on. I've been doing the meetings. And yet that thing I put on the board that I wanted to do, I'm no further along than I was two months ago. So really what I end up focusing on is like, you know what, like we don't need to really work on doing more. That's not getting us where we're trying to go. We need to work on doing more or fewer of the things that matter most. And I know that sounds better when I say it that way, but it's really about being more thoughtful and intentional and having better priorities around those things that you want to see done and that you want to be celebrating at the end of the year, or the end of a you know decade. Well, that, and so go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying that that makes sense. So, like the first thing that's probably a roadblock is just people have other wrong priorities that prevent them from getting started on the stuff that really matters. Yeah, well, you know, I'm tricky about saying wrong priorities. I call them competing priorities because there are some competing there's some priorities we have that are clearly ours and then there are some priorities we have that are essentially other people's priorities. And sometimes we can't really clearly distinguish between the two. And even when it's just our own competing priorities, um, you know, the classic sort of I want creative freedom versus I want a secure paycheck comes up a lot, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurs and creative types, because there seems to be this tension between the two. Um, but we can think, you know, more generally, and, and I want to pause here because really start finishing. Um, it's a productivity book. Yes. But more broadly speaking, it's a book about changing your life because um, to go from your current state of your life to some future better version or your best version of yourself, like there's a big gap there for a lot of people. And you've bridged that gap through completed projects, through finished projects. And if you're not doing the types of projects that are going to build that better future for yourself, you're going to stay stuck. Um, and so, and I want to say that because as we unfold this conversation more, I'm going to be talking about weaving the work of our lives into our schedule and prioritizing that just as much as we do, you know, the economic work or, or the, you know, the life of our work. And I think that's one of the challenges to go to it, Brett, is that so many of us have these competing priorities and so many of us can feel that, that resentment or, or exasperation or regret because when we sit down to say, you know, these are the things, these are the ways I'm going to spend my day. What happens is our economic work gets prioritized, it gets scheduled, it gets thought about. And unfortunately, the work of our lives gets, you know, the afterthoughts or maybe gets like squeezed in the cracks that are left over from the economic work. And so what we end up being is, you know, if we do that too long, we become these husks of people that go to work, we punch the clock, we do the commute, we do the meetings, we do all the work. But then when we look, we're fundamentally not fulfilled because we're not doing the work of our lives. So competing priorities is one of the first places I will generally go when people are telling me that they're not doing what they what matters most to them. And so, you know, just working through those competing priorities and are these your priorities or are there sometimes um, on our own priorities, we have really powerful priorities that we don't acknowledge. So I'll take parenting. I'm not a parent myself, but many parents say and understand and act out the fact that kids take a lot of time and care and a lot of energy and a lot of your life when you are raising children. We know that. And yet, when we set New Year's resolutions, when we set big plans for ourselves, a lot of times we don't think about the amount of temporal weight, emotional weight, 
logistical weight that having kids can have. And that's going to sit on our availability to do other things. And so, you know, um, that's just one of those where I, I know a lot of people can, on the one hand, really be, really say truthfully, like their kids and their family are the number one priority. But when it comes time to how they think about what they're going to do with their month or what they're going to do with their quarter or what they're going to do with their year, they forget how much weight that's going to take up. And they over plan on top of that very weighty, that very important thing. And I'm just going to pause here and, and then move on. I just want to remind folks that being a great parent, being a great family member, being a great member of your community is being productive, right? I, ha- I hate the conversation of I can be productive or I can be with my family. I think we need to re- readdress our priorities there. So um, I know I've been hitting on this one quite a bit, Brett, but that's really one of the first places I'd hit. The second one would be head trash. And head trash is just the amalgam of self-defeating stories we tell ourselves, some of the cultural BS that we'll pick up, some of the ways we see the world that they don't have to be that way. But the thing about head trash is it doesn't have to be true of the world for it to work on us. So I'm a writer. And, you know, even though I've spent the last couple of decades of writing, like I can occasionally have that thought because, you know, creatives are are insecure folks. A lot of times I'm like, man, I'm a terrible writer. What am I doing? I should just go like get a normal job, quit this writing stuff and so on and so forth. Now, the reality is I'm either a good writer or I'm good enough to keep doing it and keep getting paid to do it. Right. But that head trash, if I were to let it take hold, can actually determine what steps I might take. It might determine what goals I might set. It might determine what projects I might do, even though it's false, right? And so if you had that teacher in third grade that told you you were terrible at math and that you'd never be anything and you hung on to that, yes, it sounds overly psychological or like like a cliche, but the reality is if you hold on to that belief and you let it guide your actions, you'll end up playing that script out even though it's not actually true of you. And so those two things um, tend to account for a lot of the reasons why people get stuck and they're not filling that gap and finishing those projects. And you know, the last thing I'll say is if we start talking about the work that we need to do with other people, the other major challenge is poor team alignment. And by that, not just your work team, but your life team as well. A lot of times our teams are not aligned because we haven't told the team where we want to go and why we want to go there. And, you know, it's just frustrating thing that we, despite evidence to the contrary, we keep expecting people to be mind readers and understand where we want to go and what help we need and how our priorities line up. And that doesn't happen. And in lieu of us being clear about the direction we want our life to go, it's more likely that we're going to be in a tug of war with other people who may otherwise if brought into alignment, be very powerful forces of change for us. Well, I think it's interesting that the the problems you laid out that you see over and over again, they're not so much like tactical problems. Like people aren't planning incorrectly. They might be doing things that can help them along, but it's like, it's a mindset problem. And you have to deal with that stuff first before you get to the more tactical, here's how I plan my day out sort of thing. Absolutely. Because, you know, planning your day out, I think people mistake it and think that it's a cerebral problem but it's really an emotional problem because it's not hard conceptually to plan out your day. It's really hard when, you know, that day comes to maintain your boundaries, to say the right yeses, to say the no's where you need to. And if you don't have this foundational layer of priority setting and value setting, it's easy for those plans just to crumble by what seems to be urgent and what seemed well, what is urgent and what seems to be important that's right in front of us when, you know, the reality is we unfortunately have bought into the tyranny of the urgent. Some a lot of times through our devices, through our smartphones, through email and things like that. And we end up thinking that everything that is an herb be acting, I'll say. We don't think it. We'll end up acting as if a lot of the urgent stuff is the important stuff. And we end up in this whirlwind of, you know, incoming text and social media and email and whatever. And like that rocking chair that, you know, um, is got a lot of motion, but no progress. We end up in that swirl so long and it becomes easier to get out of that whirlwind. It becomes easier to get out of that tyranny of the urgent 
when you can just look at something and say, you know what? That's really not important to me. Or that's going to suck to not be able to do that. And I might have to face some consequences for it. But this thing over here is more important to us. And think about it this way, Brett. I think the challenge that we have with doing the projects that matter, quick sidebar, project to me is anything that takes time, energy, and attention to complete, which means not just your economic projects. It also counts the projects of your life. So closets of doom, getting married, you know, moving across the sea, you know, moving across the nation, um, finally getting your kids off the couch and on the college or to the first, you know, career or at least out of your house. All of those things count as projects. So there are times in our life when and true urgency and importance comes up. Like, you know, I'll go back to the parenting things. When the school calls and your kid is sick, you don't think about like everything that's on your list of do stuff to do today. You don't, you know, we don't have to do some big conceptual matrix of what we're doing. We go pick our kids up and we take care of them. When your partner is sick or in a car accident, or if your, you know, um, parents or elders are aging and you're taking care of them, there are very clear priorities like that where we don't seem to have nearly as much of the head trash around it and our priorities become super clear. The thing about these life-changing projects that I keep referring to, these projects that take our time, energy, and attention, is that a lot of times they're not of the type that we have permission to do them, right? Or we have some clear manifest to do them. So we have to claim that space to be able to do them. And I think that's when a lot of the head trash will start to pop up. And that's where we get competing priorities because the head trash will pop up because, you know, let's say it's writing a book, starting a business, starting a nonprofit, creating a hobby, farm, getting married, whatever, right? That's when we have those mini existential crises. Like, am I the right person? Is this the right time? Do I have what it takes? What if I fail? And that's where that stuff comes up. And unfortunately, we have somehow encoded the belief that, or at least the working principle, that if it's hard, that we shouldn't do it. And if we're not certain about it, then we shouldn't do it. When the fact of the matter is, a lot of times that emotional flailing, I call it thrashing, that when we thrash, it's because something matters to us. We don't thrash about doing the trash or about taking out the trash or doing laundry, changing the dishes, doing errands. Like there's just a lot of things we don't get that involved in. We either do them or we don't do it. We might be frustrated by them, but it's not that sort of existential Who am I? Am I the right person? Am I good enough? Someone else is doing it. We only do those when it comes to projects that really, really matter to us. And that's one of the insights that I want to get across to people because I want us to be running towards those things that are difficult. I want us to be running towards those things that make us uncomfortable rather than staying over here on the shallow shores of the comfort and the low hanging fruit. And then just checking the box and getting something else done. Because we know what that gets us and we don't like where it takes us. So you mentioned thrashing behaviors. What are some examples of thrashing behaviors you see in people you work with? Quote unquote research. You know, when you ask them about something and they're like, oh, well, I've been researching that for like two or three months. Now there's a certain amount of research that we all need to do, but you know, in any of these sort of best work projects, which is what I call these life-changing projects, there's always going to be this gap between the amount of information available and the amount of information that, you know, would really help you make the decision. And there's always that leap. And so what people try to do is try to make that gap so small that they're, you know, taking that certainty there. Procrastination for a lot of people is thrashing just avoiding it. Now, the funny thing about that is, or I I find it really interesting is we don't really procrastinate and we don't really need an accountability system and we don't really need accountability buddies to eat ice cream, right? If it's in front of us or whatever your dessert is, if it's in front of us, we'll eat it. And there's an insight there because we typically, typically don't procrastinate from things that we either really enjoy to do or that we manifestly know are tied to something that truly mattered to us. Now I'll say typically because we will procrastinate when it comes to, you know, ideas and when it comes to some of these really impactful ideas, because that's mostly head trash and that's mostly us trying to get ready to be ready to get ready. If that makes any sense. Like, it's like, Oh yeah, I got to work up to it. And then once I'm work, I can work up to it, then I can do it. And we spend so much time working up to it 
than if we just started doing it and figured it out on the fly, we'd be better off. So procrastination can be one. I have a buddy, really successful buddy, and I have to call him on him. We're in a mastermind crew. And I know that he's thrashing when he starts setting up a bunch of interviews with people and conversations and meetings with people about a project that he already knows how to do. And because we've talked about it and he knows how to do it, but he's still in this sort of, I'm going to talk to a bunch of people. I'm going to see the lay of the field, so on and so forth. But I know him well enough to know that he's going to do it his own way. And not much of that information is actually going to be useful for him whatsoever. And so, you know, he can spend six to nine months just in conversations with folks and kind of fishing and dabbling where if he just spent that nine months, like making the first steps on his own, he would be that much further along. Sometimes shopping could be a way that people do it. So I guess one way to see thrashing is like some of us are, some of us have our own ways of productive procrastination. Other of us know, and and most people, Brett, when I talk to them as, as their coach, and I say like, so when you're scared of a project and you're thrashing, what do you do? They can tell me what they do, right? They know they're doing it. And so that's how I'll just spot them. Like, hey, I noticed that you're doing that thing there. And they're like, oh, crap, call. And so those are some of the ways. And, you know, most of the time people know what thrashing looks like for them. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I've, I know my thrashing. I've done the research. I do the research thing. Like, oh, let's keep researching, researching. Like, oh, wait got to stop this and just start, I got to do one, I got to start taking action on this. And once I start taking action, things start solving themselves. Yeah. The army calls it gathering intelligence through action, which what we would say in, (laughs) in the entrepreneurial or creative spaces, do stuff and see what happens. Simple as that. Well, so let's go back to this idea of competing priorities. As you said, this is one of the first places you start with clients. You look at their competing priorities and try to help them figure out the stuff they can eliminate. Um, the projects they can eliminate from their life so they can focus on the things that that really matter to them um so how do you how do you go about that like what questions do you ask to help them figure out those that the, the answer to that question like what should you eliminate from your life because that's hard to do because i think a lot of people when they say I, i'm going to stop this project they think well i'm quitting quitting is for losers i don't want to do that so they just keep doing it so wh- how do you walk a client through that yeah so a little bit of sit up there so These best work projects, again, I'm going to go back to bridging that gap. So I need to, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but there's this other thing that we have to remember is that this is the concept of displacement, that anything you do displaces or prevents you from doing a near infinity of other things that you might've done with that same time, energy, and attention. So it turns out that a lot of people are doing projects that would have built the type of life they wanted to have two years ago but they've moved on and it, you know, something is different now. And the project is not taking them fundamentally into this best or into this better future that they want to live in. And so if that's one of those scenarios, the very best thing that you can do is drop that project midstream. And yes, I know quitting is for losers and things like that, but think about it. If it's going to take you the next three months to complete that project, but that project does not take you where you want to go, one, you've spent three months on that project, but two, more importantly, you've displ- that project has displaced another project that could have taken you there, right? And so one of the reasons we end up getting so overloaded, and I don't use overwhelm much, like when I'm working with clients and, and people in my community, like we get to say overwhelmed like, you know, two or three times, but then after that point, I switch it. I say, look, here's why we're not talking about overwhelmed. We're only overwhelmed when we're overloaded, right? Overwhelm is an emotion. I love understanding our emotions and being there, but we, you know, the only way we get out of that emotion is if we change the load. And so, you know, if we just replace that overwhelmed with overloaded, then we can start to say, okay, how do I pull my load down? And one of the ways you pull your load down is again, looking at those projects. One of the things you can do is look at those projects that yes, you committed to, Yes, you may have spent a certain amount of time doing it. Yes, you may have spent a bunch of money. You may have you know, said you were going to do it and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, if that project is not taking you where you want to go, you need to let it go because it's, it's displacing something else. But usually what, what this looks like, Brett, is just asking folks, like, let's imagine it's the end of the year. You know, let's say it's 12 months from now and we're celebrating, you know, we're meeting up for drinks and I'm like, you know, what are, what are three to five things that you want to be celebrating? And then most people know. They know sort of the things that they would like to celebrate. 
And then of that three to five, ask like, what's the one that would make the most difference that would be the most compelling that would change your life the most? Like there are different ways of asking that question. And a lot of people, that one gets trickier. Another way that I'll say that is let's imagine, you know, all these plans that you have for yourself, especially at the life level, as opposed to the project level. Let's imagine that there were, you know, that small handful of of things that you want to do. Which one hurts the most? If I were to say, you know, I'm going to take that project from you and you'll never be able to do it for the rest of your life. It's just done. Never, ever. That one tends to wake people up in a lot of ways. Cause once us, you know, they can kind of see me grabbing for it. Like, like, no, not that one. Right. And you can sort of start triaging and start feeling which ones have the most weight. And that pain is super important because at the end of the day, emotion drives action. That's what we forget. Right. We think our brains drive action, but not so much It's actually emotion. Um, and so tying to those things that like you most want to do can be super important by just noticing that pain, that wince, that, that, uh, you know, I was given a presentation for this book and one of my friends who is also a client, he had said, you know, Charlie, I thought I was done with writing books. He's written two, three books now. He's like, but then when we did that exercise and you started talking about taking some potential projects away from me, I felt a visceral pain when you grabbed for this next book concept that I was, that, that I kind of been toying with. And so I'm writing that book now. And that's, you know, that's one way that we can really sort through and, and figure that out. Another way of doing that would be just having people think more clearly about which of the projects and goals tie to who they most want to be versus who they think they should be. You know, it doesn't take very long as a coach before you realize how disastrous of a word should can be because people should all over themselves all day. And so just about any time that I see someone like say there's something that they should be doing. It's all, I mean, it's like 90% sure that it's coming from some external source because that's not the language that we use when it's our own stuff. We use, I want to do, I get to do, I'm looking forward to it. We use a much more positive language, but when it's an external priority and when it's some, something that they, you know, believe is important to them because of other people's belief systems and things like that, we'll almost always use should there. And so that's a tell that that's a potential project that might be able to go if we can't find the internal alignment between that project and their own priorities. So those are a few ways I would work through that. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you turn your intentions into actions. We've done that in a few ways. We first, we created a series of 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. There's hard skills like self-defense, wilderness survival, outdoor skills, soft skills like public speaking, social skills, personal finance, how to be a better husband, better father. We also provide accountability for you for your physical activity every day, doing a good deed so you're starting to think outside of yourself and thinking about something bigger. And then we also provide weekly challenges. They're going to put you outside of your comfort zone physically, intellectually, socially. And besides, Besides the uh, weekly challenges and the the daily check-ins and the badges, TSL Platform also provides a way for you to get together with other TSL members in your area so you can meet up in actual physical space and start doing stuff together. And the guys, the meetups are, it's a ground up thing. They're organizing it themselves. Some events are really simple just to get together for a ruck for an hour, but then other groups are planning these multi-day events where they're doing all sorts of stuff, camping outside and working on TSL stuff together. So it's a real community that's been formed here. If you'd like to get in our next enrollment, head over to strenuouslife.co. You can see everything that's involved with the Strenuous Life and then make sure you get your email on our waiting list. That'll help you be the first one to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, check it out and make sure to get your email on our waiting list. And I hope to see you in one of our next enrollments for the Strenuous life. And now back to the show. No, that's great. So this is all very high level stuff. You're trying to get aware of your competing priorities and eliminating the ones that that don't really call to you, right? Or even using that loss aversion, like which one would hurt if you took it away? Then you're also getting aware of the head trash you've been telling yourself, the, the, the story you've been telling yourself. And that this is like really important stuff because a lot of times people overlook this and they go right to, like I said, the tactical. But once you've taken care of this stuff, and I'm sure this is something that's not like one and done, you're constantly working through this stuff the entire time. But once you've got a good idea of you know, what are your most, like your best work projects you want to do, that's when you start getting more brass tacks. And you start off, the first thing you got to do, you got to start planning. And the first part of a plan is establishing a goal. Now, I think everyone's heard about goals and they've set goals for themselves, but 
most people sell, set goals that aren't very effective. How do most people construct goals and what's the better way to do that so it, it's more concrete? Yeah, I think people can get super confused about, well, part of it is just unclear goals. And so, you know, we talk about the SMART framework, which, you know, there's a more corporate version is the one that I use in the book, which is specific, meaningful, actionable, relevant, and um, trackable. And first off is just knowing where you're trying to go and what that looks like. And one of the things that I think people don't do a good enough job of is when it comes to that realistic one and that realistic component of trying to think about like where they currently are and where they're trying to go and the amount of effort that they're going to put behind that change. And so, you know, in the book, I kind of shift the conversation towards thinking about three levels of success. So there's small, moderate, and epic. And if you're not a millennial, you can say extreme, it's cool, right? Um, And those three different levels of success as a gauge for thinking through where you want this project to go and what you want this final outcome to look like. And the reason I, I started doing that is I actually fell into that one backwards from my coaching work because I noticed that people were starting with a very black white version. So it's like you either succeed or you fail. Right. And that was it. I was like, well, there are like layers here. There are like, you know, degrees of success and degrees of failure. And once we started talking about more degrees of success and really being realistic about what we can do, then it's really helped people change things. Because for instance, I think what we often do is a lot of people want say an epic success but they're not willing to put in the epic effort it takes to get there. Okay. And when we think more clearly and cogently about this and say, you know what? I want to do this thing. I'm okay with it being a a small success because it's more important that I do it. And that, you know, that's the amount of effort that I can put behind it than I don't do it. And so I think that sort of go big, go home mentality has crept into the way we plan and way we set goals so that we don't see that, you know what, like I don't have to, so let's say you have a fitness goal, right? You don't have to go from sitting on the couch to running a marathon, right? Small successes might be, you know what, I'm going to go from sitting on a couch to going to the gym twice a week. And I'm okay with that because that fits in with my broader goals. I'm you know, going to be healthy that way. I don't need to be a marathon runner. I don't need to be a gym rat. I don't need to go that far on sort of the business side of things, especially for creative entrepreneurs and small business and micro business owners, you know, I think too many people are not comfortable with saying, you know what, the goal of this business is to provide a healthy living income for me. That's all I wanted to do. That's all it's set up to do. It doesn't need to be a $10 million business. It doesn't need to be much bigger than that. And where this comes up, Brett, is when we go back to those competing priorities, if you set the difficulty ne- level up, you know, to moderate and epic across all places of your life, you're going to be stretched super thin. And so dialing it down and say, you know what, with this project, I'm looking for a small success. I'm looking for a moderate success, I'm looking for an epic success. And I'm going to modulate or I'm going to apply the amount of effort relevant to that level of goal setting, as opposed to putting in a small amount of effort and expecting extreme or epic results. And the last thing that I'll say here is while you're thinking about goal setting is if you can do it by yourself without the help of other people, it's at best a moderate success. It's probably a small success, but at best it's a moderate success. You only get epic success when you recruit other people and when you bring in other people and shift the conversation from personal productivity and personal effectiveness to community effectiveness. That's the only way you get epic results. And so, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm busting my butt and I'm, you know, I'm going after this big goal, but they, you see that they haven't really built a team around them, built an alliance around them. Odds are they're either not going to meet their goal or they're going to do so at such a high cost. And it's going to take them so long that um, it's really not going to work out for them in a way. And last thing I'll say about this whole epic epic goal and bringing people into it is if it truly matters to you as one of those super important goal, it turns out it's really, it's much simpler to build a team around that and to build your life around that. But you can only do that something on something that truly, truly matters to you. 
And last thing I'll say here is don't try to do everything epic, like choose one thing at a time to, to go that, that hard at and be comfortable with the other things that might need to be at small and moderate success. And I, I originally got this from my good friend, Michael Bungay Stanier, who in his book, Do More Great Work, talked about acceptable mediocrity. And the basic insight that he had then is like, and he was talking about largely people working in corporate America is there are plenty of things in your job that you can be acceptably mediocre at and you won't get fired. And so if you really want to do more great work to use his language and, you know, I'm sort of piggybacked and say, if you really want to start finishing things that matter most, find those areas of your life where good enough is good enough and reallocate that emotional energy, that time, that attention and that money towards the projects that really, really do matter to you that you're willing to put that additional heft behind. I think that's a, that was a really great insight the, about the small, mediocre and epic successes in the book, because yeah, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of times, not oftentimes, not a lot of times, but oftentimes uh, people set epic goals because they think they should, like they should want a company that grows fast and gets VC funding and whatever. And then, but when they actually try to do it, they don't like it. But they keep doing it because they think, well, I should be doing this. this is what you do when you start a business. When they could be like, you know what? I'm going to have a moderately successful business, provide me a, a good living for my family. And that's that's great. I, I enjoy that. Yeah, I enjoy that. And that lets me like actually enjoy the fruit of the labor with my family, right? And that lets me be this multifaceted person that can have hobbies, Right. And they can do all these other things because I'm not all consumed by this one thing. So I absolutely think it's right. That's where I, a lot of the shit game comes in. Right. And if someone has like, I'm, I'm not the guy that questions people's goals and or excuse me, questions their values and priorities. If someone said like, Charlie, I want to build a $20 million company. That's what I want to do. I'm like, okay, well, let's figure out why. So I know where this ties into things. But if it turns out that that's really their jam, then that's what we're going to go about building. Anything else is not going to be that like they're they're going to rebel and self sabotage on anything that's not directed towards that. However, a lot of times when you really get down and talk to people about why things matter to them, you realize that there are many other ways for them to reach where they're trying to go. So you got your project, you got your goal, and you talk about in the book, you know, of course you're not going to you're, you're going to want to break this down into chunks, right? You can't just be like I'm going to get married. Well, there's a lot to, you know, do to get married or put on a wedding. And I think people naturally know what those those chunks are like you know but and then you can plan on a monthly and a weekly and a quarterly basis and you go through that in the book but i one thing i found really powerful and this is something you've been talking about since way back in 2008 when i first discovered uh, productive flourishing this idea of momentum planning and daily and weekly planning what does that look like for people and you know and, and does it have to be really complicated and how can this help people move forward with their, their goals they set out for these different projects they have for themselves? Yeah. So momentum planning, thanks for that, Brett. Momentum planning is just the continual process of using the different scopes of, or the different time perspectives to trigger the amount of planning that's relevant for that amount of time. Now that's very abstract. So let me break it down this way. When it's a new month, you do your monthly plan. When it's a new week, you look at your monthly plan and your monthly plan guides what your week should look like. When you do your day, your week should guide what the day should look like and so on. And the hard part of it is the original setup because it's a different way of thinking about it. It combines another powerful planning framework that I have called the five projects rule, which is the long way of saying that there's no more than five active projects per time perspective. And so per time perspective is just that's meaning that I think most of us intuitively know the difference between a week sized project and a month sized project. We intuitively know the difference between a month sized project and a quarter sized project. We intuitively know the difference between a quarter sized project and a year sized project. And that can be really helpful for us because where we often get super stuck with planning and prioritization is we're spanning over too many different time perspectives. And so we're, you know, and it's, it can get very tactical here. I know most of our conversation here today, Brett's been, been fairly higher level, but it comes down to like, I can look at someone's to-do list and the way they write their action, <laughs> their action items and know how clearly they think about time. Because you'll see things, you'll see two, three items that are like week sized projects. And then you'll see like two tasks on there. And then you'll see like a year sized project that's not chunked down all on the same list. 
And that makes our brains go haywire because it's trying to think about the size of it's the, it's the analog of trying to think about the size of an ant, the size of a basketball and the size of America at the same time. Our brains just can't do it. Right. And so what momentum planning does is it helps us stay constrained to the time perspective. And so, you know what, this week, I've got five projects that I'm going to work on this week, five of my active projects this week. What are my months? What are, how do those relate to my five month size projects? Can I chunk it down? So on and so forth. Now it gets pretty quick because once you've done the homework or once you've done the work of setting up what you want your say quarter to look like, or your month to look like any planning, any time perspective under that super easy to plan, right? Especially if you use the five projects rule. And you also don't have to say, be thinking about your month size plan and getting into the nitty gritty of what you're going to do each day. That, that doesn't, that makes no sense, right? That would be like planning every bathroom stop on a trip from California to, you know, New York. You don't really need to do that, right? So what it typically comes down to is once people get set up doing it, it takes them about two hours a week when they start using things like the 10-15 split. 10-15 split is you spend 15 minutes at the end of your day reviewing what you've done and reviewing what you need to do and setting up what you need to do the next day. And then you spend 10 minutes the next morning looking over that plan, making sure nothing shifted and doing, doing again. So when you do it frequently enough, it's about like anything else you do that you've habituated yourself to do. It's super simple, doesn't take as much time, and it's way better than trying to figure out via email what you should do for the day, which is unfortunately many people's default is wake up, look at email, email determines what they should do. But think about that. That means that usually someone else's agenda has anchored your day before you've even thought about what your agenda is for the day. And that's one of those ways we end up upside down in this priority and productivity game is that we spend so much time chasing other people's priorities and then figuring out, you know, at three o'clock in the day, like, wait a second, I had these other things that I wanted to do today, but your time's all up. So it's just really momentum planning is just really that process of giving us the grace of not being great at planning and not being great at what seeing at seeing what's coming down the pipe and developing a daily process of adjusting for that and getting ever better. And, you know, when reality changes to change your plan. No, I love that. Cause I think a lot of people have this idea that planning is going to take a lot of time, but it doesn't have to. Once you, I mean, when you first start doing it, it's a skill you have to develop. It'll take you a little bit longer, but once you do it on a regular basis, you can get it done really fast. Yeah. I mean, you can get it done really fast. And the thing about it is, is when it comes time to any of these new habits, new ways of working, what I always remind people is like the first thing we're going to find is we're going to find fat that we can trim from your current schedule. We're just going to find stuff to steal from. Right. And so sometimes people are like, Oh, like 30 minutes a day, I can't do it. And yet if you were to look at their, like their time logs, you'd see that they spent 75 minutes on social media. And it's like, well, you have the time, you're just using it differently, right? And so, so what, what was that? It's a paraphrase of Henry Ford's, like, I get ahead in the time people waste. Right. And so we just look for those times. And so that's what I would want to ask, like, you know, when it comes to some of these other projects, like developing a meditation practice or a mindfulness practice, people are like, oh, like, how am I going to find 20 minutes a day? A lot of us can find 20 minutes a day, turns out. Now, there are some people, like, if you've got, you know, a special needs family, and you're the you're the primary caregiver and it's just literally you have to be on you know on vigilance all the time then yeah i get that it may be really really hard and so there are outliers through this but most of us we can find 30 minutes an hour a day that we can steal from something else and so what happens there and we kind of we didn't talk about it earlier so i'm gonna say this like a lot of folks have what i call creative constipation which is they've taken in so many ideas, they've taken in so much inspiration, they've taken in so many things that they want to do, and they're not moving on them, that at a certain point, it gets toxic on them, right? It starts backing up, they start getting frustrated. And we've all seen people who are creati- creatively constipated. And I think m- many of us have been creatively constipated at, at our point in our, li- in our life. And the reason I wanted to throw that in, in at this point in the conversation is when we start talking about some of these changes that you need to make, 
it's always what I'm going to ask is, would you rather be moving the projects that are going to change your life and make you feel better or keep doing what you're doing that's got you creatively constipated? Because that's your default. All right. So if you want to get out of that, yeah, maybe we find and we steal 15, 30 minutes from somewhere else. But you know what? That 15, 30 minutes that you're spending it on on whatever you're currently spending is making you unhappy. It's not taking you where you want to go. So losing that isn't an actual pain. It may feel like it in in the moment because we are creatures of habit and creatures where we want to keep doing what we keep doing. I get that. But the payoff from finishing some of these best work projects is so high that it's worth it. And if you can still, you know, 30 minutes a day, you know, from, you know, this week. So it kind of be one of those challenges every day, find 30 minutes that you can steal some time from and apply it to a best work project. And again, it doesn't have to be a work project. It could be getting in shape, playing guitar, playing video games. So that's your jam. Don't care. Right. What I don't care what it is. It's just that it fires you up and it, it makes you come alive. Do that this week, maintain it, try to find another 30 minutes next week, right? So that you're stealing an hour a day you reclaimed an hour every day. Then next week, find another 30 minutes. You're going to reach a point to where, you know, you can't find an additional, you know, it's hard to find six hours of fat in our schedules every day, but you know, I've been doing this over a decade, Brett. A lot of folks can find two and a half, three hours a day pretty easily. No, I agree. And I, I think some of the other beauty of the, the daily momentum planning is that it keeps you honest. It keeps you doing things instead of just, I think one thing, another way people thrash is planning. There's like, well, I just got to keep planning. I'm going to plan, do my weekly plan, do my monthly plan. But the daily planning, you see right there, if you've moved forward with the project at all, if you've taken action. And I think that keeps you from that thrash, that planning thrashing that sometimes people do. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about it is it doesn't take long. Right. And in the way, because, you know, it also ties in block planning. So block planning is just the ideas rather than using normal calendar planning of like eight to nine is rethinking your schedule and thinking, okay, there are certain types of blocks or certain types of energy blocks throughout today. I have four different kinds, but it turns out that focus blocks, which are 90 to 120 minute blocks of time where you can focus on a particular project. It becomes super easy when you're doing your momentum planner, because if there are no focus blocks on a day, you're not going to move one of those projects forward. You're just not. There's no time, right? If you look over your week and you're doing your weekly momentum planning and you see like, wait a second, I've got these three projects, but because I'm going to be on vacation, I'm going to be traveling, I'm going to be doing these other things. I've only got two focus blocks. Okay, well, you know from the get-go that one of those projects is going to lose, right? Which one is going to lose? And you can be more intentional about that from the beginning. I want us to pull some of this pain and some of this frustration to the beginning of our days, weeks, or projects, as it were, rather than getting to the getting to Friday or getting to Sunday or getting to some terminal point and looking back and feeling like there's something wrong with you or you're uniquely defective or you can't get your crap together. I was like, no, you just didn't have time, right? You had three focus blocks that week. That was the limiting factor for what you were going to do. Did you use them well? Did you not? Did you use them on the things that matter most? And if you can say at the end of the week, look, man, I had those three focus blocks. I put them on the project that really meant the most to me. It was the most meaningful. It was going to be the one that set me up as the one that I was willing to go to bat for. No matter what else happens at the end of the week, you did great, right? You did. You used what you had to the best of your ability. I would rather us start that way than kid ourselves and make the normal BS daily schedule that has like, you know, the 17 things we want to do and then the 32 tasks we have to do in the four meetings and then get to the end of the day and wonder why you didn't get anything done. Well, you got stuff done, but your day looked like Swiss cheese, right? You, you're not, you're never going to make that much progress on those projects. Cause again, focus blocks are the fuel for your best work projects, right? You are never going to make progress on that unless you recalibrated how that day looked and made the space for it and made the boundaries for it. So I know I'm on a bit of a rant here, but Brad, I feel you because I, I'm on a rant here because it's actually so much of this book comes from wanting people to be more compassionate with themselves and wanting people to find more peace because the way that we're working is not working for so many of us. And I have conversations with people every day where they're upset, 
they're overwhelmed, they're regretful, and just exasperated. And just finally being able to say, you know what? You get five projects this week. I know it's really hard to accept right now, but it's better than putting 17 on for this week and being so in the whirlwind that you get two done and then you feel bad about it. I'd rather us get three, four done, knock it out, call it a great week and do that week over week over week because Brett, that's where that that life changing stuff happens. It's not the sprints that we want to go on. It's not those weekends where you really crank down. It's can you show up and keep the work going week after week after week? Because weeks become months, months becomes quarters. And most people, once they start mastering being able to shape and weave quarters together, that's where they really get some momentum going because you know, when you look at a lot of the projects you want to do, whether it's getting married, the one you used earlier, or writing books or starting businesses, starting nonprofits, doing substantial community work, they're at least quarter size projects, but they're usually much longer than that. So you got to learn to weave those together. And it starts with seeing how your days and weeks are rolling and flowing together. Well, Charlie, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? If you want to learn more about the book, you go to startfinishingbook.com. Again, that's startfinishingbook.com, all one word. And if you want to see the greater body of work, you go to productiveflourishing.com. I mean, that's where everything lives. And you got those PDF planners there. Yeah, um, you can go to productiveflourishing.com forward slash free dash planners. But if you go to Productive Flourishing, it's in the nav bar. Yeah, they're all free. You don't have to sign up. Don't. I mean, I would love your email address. I'd love you to become part of the community. But you know, you can just get them and use them. Learn from the. I don't know. We're up to twenty five hundred blog posts and articles on PF at this point. So there's a lot there to learn. And there's also every month we have our monthly momentum call, which is a no cost Q and A community jam session where other people jump on and talk about the project they're doing and get some free coaching. So yeah, if you're interested in those and you want to start bridging that gap between where you are and that, that life you most want to live, check out startfinishingbook.com. All right, Charlie Gilkey, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Brett. My guest today was Charlie Gilkey. He's the author of the book, Start Finishing. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You also find out more information about his work at his website, productiveflourishing.com. You can download some free momentum planners there. Pretty cool. I used them back in law school over 10 years ago. And you can also check out our show notes at aom.is slash productive flourishing, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the AWIM podcast. Check out our website at artofmanliness.com where you can find our podcast archives as well as thousands of articles we've written over the years. Also, check out our online platform, The Strenuous Life. It's a platform that helps you put into action all the things we've been writing about and talking about on AOM for the past 10 years, strenuouslife.co. Make sure you get your email on our waiting list for our next enrollment in April. And if you'd like to enjoy ad-free episodes of the AOM podcast, you can do so on Stitcher Premium. Head over to Stitcher Premium right now, sign up, use code MANLINESS for a free month trial. Once you're signed up, download the Stitcher app on Android or iOS and you start enjoying ad-free episodes of the Art of Manliness podcast. And finally, if you got something out of the show, I'd appreciate you take one minute